Back here on the Meat Speak podcast, powered by the certified Angus beef brand. Brian Schaff joining me via Zoom. Meat scientist Diana Clark, how are you? Doing pretty good. Excellent, excellent. Okay. Really excited about what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and so I would like to state that our guest today is a Regents Professor of Meat Science at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. Gigum, right? I had to learn what the Gigum sign was, by the way, in preparation. <laughs> he completed his undergrad at Cal State Bakersfield and his PhD at UC Davis, which is also the same institution as another former podcast guest of ours, Dr. Frank Mitlerner. Uh, mm -hmm. At Texas A&M, he teaches meat science, nutrition, and physiological nutrition courses and conducts research on the growth and development of adipose tissue or more commonly known as fat, particularly in cattle. Uh, in addition, he has investigated the limitation of cattle to marble and has used his background in molecular biology to investigate lipid metabolism in the bovine muscle. Please welcome to the podcast the man who I'm counting on to definitively tell me whether or not I'm actually big boned, Dr. <laughs> Steve Smith. <laughs> Sir, how are you? Oh, I'm great. Thank you. Um, I, I should say, um, I can't even grade a carcass. <laughs> my, <laughs> my degrees are in uh, biology and, and metabolic physiology, and I came down to a in 1983 uh, just to use the tools that I have to study marbling and beef cattle. So fat is my life. So well, I was actually going to ask that, like, what got you into meat science? Because given your background and everything, your bachelor's uh, degree and uh, PhD, I was, yeah, I was kind of shocked to see that. That's pretty neat to see where your path has taken you. Well, uh, by way of background, in 1979, I, I uh, came to uh, Dallas, Texas for um, uh, a, a national meeting, and I was looking around for jobs, and I'd spent four years um, in rat research, and I was tired of rats, tired of rat liver cells, <laughs> and uh, and the, most of the people that I interviewed with just wanted me to do the same old thing that I, I'd be, always been doing. And a guy from uh, the Meat Animal Research Center in Clay Center, Nebraska, uh, Ron Pryor, came up and said, "How would you like to work in beef cattle uh, fat?" And I said, well, that's, it's not rat, it's not a liver cell, I'm all in. But, <laughs> and it, um, I lived in Hastings for four years and a small town, I thought, you know, Davis is a small town, Hastings, Hastings is a small town. How different could it be? <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, Davis is so liberal, they won't let the, eat the right wing of a chicken. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, so I got into beef cattle nutrition and, it, and then uh, metabolism of adipose tissue fat. And then a position opened up here in uh, 1983 with the meat science section. And so I said, oh, I'd really like to get back to uh, university life. And, you know, College Station is a smallish town, and, and <laughs> but not as small as Hastings, Nebraska. So yeah, that's so for I, sure. So I've been there ever since. I've been here. So, but, 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 but can you, uh, can you speak on the amount of marbling found in a rat ribeye? I would like to know. <laughs> um, okay, sure. <laughs> the carcasses are hard to grade and, and there's not much market for them, but <laughs> they're, they're bite size. You know, fat is one of those things that, that we knew when, uh, we were getting in and getting ready to launch season two of this podcast. Fat is one of those things that we, we knew we wanted to touch on because, you know, if you trace back certified Angus beef, which, you know, obviously is, is where this podcast comes from. We like to think we're, you know, we like to think we're unbiased, but obviously we're a little biased towards that. But fat is a big reason why we exist as a company, because at the time in the 70s, the beef carcass had less fat in it, less marbling in it through breeding decisions and different, different long story on that. But fat is really important to kind of who we are as a company. And really over the years, it is, it has kind of been maligned, especially back in the seventies and eighties to where it is today. Um, so can, can you talk to us about the importance of fat uh, specifically in, in just the normal human diet? It's not necessarily something that, that you should be shying away from, correct? Oh, that's absolutely right. And I should say, um, when I was doing my undergrad in Bakersfield, I saw the first restaurant that advertised CAB. So I thought, I didn't know what that was. And, you know, 
Oh, uh, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So it was, well, I left Bakersfield in, in uh, 75. So I'm pretty sure somewhere around that time I had seen that. So, that's well, really uh, neat. so back to your question, uh, the, well, fat and beef, I, I totally understand uh, why uh, CAB has uh, been pushing marbling uh, what, how many decades, for a very long time, years and years, <laughs> for decades. And um, uh, the meat scientists who are into century qualities um, in, in this uh, group, uh, they, um, uh, they have very strong evidence of going over many, many years that uh, the, the fat, the marbling is an insurance factor, uh, insurance for uh, overcook, uh, overcooking. It's a lubrication factor. It, it makes the beef juicier. So, um, and it, it imparts a pleasant flavor. Uh, now, um, now I, I am uh, terribly biased, I'll say right offhand, that um, when I say pleasant flavor, it's the flavor that most Americans are used to from uh, grain-fed beef, corn-fed beef. So yeah. it, it, with different grains, different uh, pastures, the flavor can be di <clears throat> different. So, so there are so many experts for the flavor uh, components of beef or the, the, the positive attributes of fat in beef. Um, I'm not trained in that area. I just uh, hitch my wagon onto that and I, go looking for is the fat and beef um, healthier than or it healthy uh, is it is it unhealthy and what can we do to improve uh, the, the marbling in beef and the healthfulness uh, of the fat and uh, now that said I'm not going to say that any beef is unhealthy because people just tag on to that oh it's mm -hmm. some kind of beef is unhealthy and I'm never going to say that. I just say that beef isn't bad for you, but maybe some kinds of beef are better for you. So basically, I think because like a lot of people now, even even though I feel like we've done a lot of education of showing them what marbling is and that marbling is good and it does add flavor and it's it's it is your insurance policy when cooking. But still, it amazes me. I'm, I've been recently diving into a lot of consumer panels where we simply ask them, what are your two major attributes that you look for uh, for quality of meat? And color is always by far number one, by far, which makes sense. I get that. Um, but then you throw in the term marbling and your generation 55 and older, they'll, they'll check marbling. They want it. But then anyone younger than that, they don't really know what marbling is. They look for flavor and they check flavor, but they don't fully understand it. And I feel like if they actually saw a steak in front of them that had a lot of marbling, they fear it because they think that fat in there is unhealthy for them. So in your expert opinion, what, what would you say to that if someone said, oh, that extra marbling in there is just unhealthy? Uh, two things. Um, the simple uh, approach is, you see the marbling, but that doesn't contribute a great deal to the total calories or total fat in the steak. You go from a select to a choice. Okay, there are uh, maybe four or five more grams of fat in that mm -hmm. four ounce serving. Um, so it, it's not that much fat. You know, if you trim off the outside fat and there's not that much in, uh, to start with, you're not getting that many calories from that. And, um, and, uh, the fat in beef, the, the fatty acid composition, um, is is not unhealthy. Uh, most of, most of that the fat in the beef, regardless of production system, is oleic acid, and oleic acid, which imparts the juiciness. Uh, it, it's it's a healthy fatty acid. I, I mean, you guys like olive oil and canola oil, so uh, beef it has. You know, it, it does have saturated fats, but they're lesser in abundance than oleic acid. Now that's a complicated answer. And when the guy, <laughs> the eyes glaze over, I'm going, okay, I've said enough. <laughs> oh no, we, we, we welcome the most complicated down the rabbit hole answers as you can give us. The, a lot of the people who listen to this are, are doing so because they, they want to, they want uh, assignments afterwards to have to go and Google things. So don't, <laughs> don't worry about holding back. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. Thank you. So, 
So I'm pretty, so if, if animals, the more they marble, do they have more oleic acid than in that uh, fatty acid profile? Oh, rabbit hole. <laughs> 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 um, yes, short answer. And um, well, in the 19, early 1990s, uh, the, Japan opened up beef trade with the U.S., Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of professors from a and uh, Dave Lunt and Dr. Gary Smith, uh, Dr. Dave Lunt, um, they went to Japan to learn the grading system. And uh, while they were there at Osaka and Itoham, uh, Itoham Company in Osaka, they watched the Japanese graders. And at that time, there were Japanese A5 carcasses, the, the very best. And there were American carcasses and then Australian. And it was really weird. The, the, uh, the Japanese graders would push on the outside fat or may, maybe pinch on. Now, I didn't see this. This is secondhand, but, uh, okay. but they would push on it to see if it's softer. They pinch off a piece and rub it in their hand and see if it melts. So, and the day five carcass is a very soft fat. And then the American, it was softer. What not, it was soft, but not nearly as soft as from the Japanese carcasses. And the Australian carcasses, it was very hard fat. Now, okay. this fat softness is not part of the Japanese grading system, but there's a little subjectivity going on there. So the, the harder the fat, the lower the grade and the less desirable. Um, so in that time, when I started going to Japan, well, they brought some fat samples back and lo and behold, the oleic acid was just so, so much more than I'd ever seen in an American beef carcass. Wow. So I said, okay, oleic acid has a melting point just below room temperature. So, um, so th that accounts for the softness uh, of the fat. Mm -hmm. And when I started going to Japan, 1990, 91, um, we, we visited supermarkets and there'd be an entire section uh, of beef and, and there would be, it would be labeled Wagyu in the top shelf, the, the shelf that's most of, visible, and then American beef and then Australian beef. So it was in tiers. Okay. And so, of course, the Japanese beef was most, most, the most expensive and then American and then Australian. So, um, so the, uh, but that started my uh, uh, journey into saying, okay, what is, what is it about Japanese beef that it, uh, there's so much marbling uh, and, you know, the uh, Shima Ferdi, the falling snow, um, so much <laughs> marbling and um, uh, so much oleic acid. So what we found out, you know, in the last 30 years or so that um, uh, production practices that increase marbling will also increase oleic acid. So it doesn't always work. It's not, they're not tightly genetically linked. But in general, if you feed a corn-based diet for extended periods of time, you'll get more marbling and you'll get more oleic acid. The, the, the composition of a, a corn-based diet, I, I, we think it's the starch turns out on the gene that catalyzes the synthesis of oleic acid. That's really awesome. That's a deep rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> I like that a lot, though. That's really neat to hear. And it's neat. After um, we talked with you last year, Daniel and I did a little um, experiment at the Culinary Center where we took some ground beef, just commodity trim, uh, just ordered it in. And then we actually took some certified Angus beef prime ground beef and we browned both of them and collected that fat. And then we actually used a sous vide machine. And so we raised the temperature. I think we started at like around 70 degrees and slowly just went up uh, a few degrees over uh, time. And you can see at the lower temperature, your certified Angus beef prime, that fat actually melted while the commodity was still pretty solid. Um, so it was just a really neat visual to see those differences and pretty simple to do. So we were hoping, we actually did that right before uh, COVID hit. Um, that was gonna be a goal to kind of show some people when they walked in just to, so they could see those differences um, within cattle production. Because a lot of people do ask that, especially coming into the centers, about just cattle production in general. Most chefs know that the conventionally raised, the, the grain finished cattle, that they're going to eat better and they swear by it. But they say that they have a lot of customers that go for that grass finished beef. 
And a lot of times they just think it's healthier. So in your opinion, is, is one healthier than the other or, or no? Well, um, so here, here on sensitive ground, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, I believe I, I told you guys, um, we do a lot of work with ground beef so that we can set the fat level constant, you know, gut, you get uh, grain finished, grass finished, it's gonna have different fat content in the loins or intact pieces. So we yeah. used to do a lot of uh, ground beef uh, research so we can set the fat levels the same. And, um, and then when, you know, we measure, we've actually done a lot of human studies and uh, well, I don't really? know why, um, we've published six or seven papers. So for an animal scientist, that's, that's, I guess that's a lot. Yeah, it's pretty uh, neat though. Well, and uh, bottom line is um, grain finish, grass finish, they're not bad for you. But what we consistently see with high oleic acid um, ground beef, that uh, there's an increase in HDL cholesterol, but the good cholesterol that is involved in re reverse cholesterol transport, you know, scrumming out the, the, your blood vessels, uh, taking away the cholesterol. Okay. So it's only for um, ground beef that's from grain fed cattle for a, a pretty long period of time. It, you know, the, the carcasses do get fat. And we did do an, an experiment with uh, the first one uh, with some uh, uh, fat trim from Wagyu cattle. And okay. That was high oleic acid. And that was the first time we saw that re result. We have done, we have done two studies that compare grass fed to grain fed. And um, again, uh, they don't, they don't increase the bad cholesterol, the LDL cholesterol, uh, okay. but the grain fed would increase the HDL cholesterol. So, um, so there's, there's nothing that's going to um, harm you from eating. You know, we've, we've gone as high as like 35% fat, exactly not legally ground beef, but it was yeah. <laughs> so as low as about 15%. Um, in our studies. And, uh, and we get the best results with the higher fat ground beef. So okay. there's, there's enough fat in it to have a, 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 a nutritional in, uh, or dietary impact. Um, but yeah, the human studies you, are, oh, I'm sorry. I think you might've just made uh, Brian's day with that fact. Um, he is definitely a, a ground beef burger connoisseur for sure. So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, my wife only buys um, uh, Angus ground beef. Now, uh, the store we, we shop at doesn't have CAB, mm -hmm. but um, but she's a registered dietitian or uh, it's Ardent registered dietetic nutritionist. Okay. The PhD in nutrition. Dang. And she, she insists that I don't ever talk uh, or give nutrition advice. So <laughs> I'm never going to give nutrition advice. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I think it's interesting. I think it's probably one of the most misunderstood things in the food world is the idea, you know, if you see 80, 20 ground beef, oh yeah, it's a lean to fat ratio. Got that makes perfect sense. But th there are no parameters on what that fat needs to be made of. It could be back fat, which scientifically is, is different than the marbling fat, correct? Yeah. Well, now back fat, um, I'm, glad, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> Back fat, the subcutaneous fat over the loin actually has more oleic acid than the marbling. So, really? it, and it's a, a, it's an indication of the stage of development. Back fat uh, develops first, by far oh, first. And okay. then as the, the fat cells differentiate, as they fill with lipid, they get larger, they, they uh, accumulate more oleic acid that, that my favorite gene is turned on to produce the lake acid. The marbling fat is later developing. The fat cells are smaller, uh, they're, and they just haven't caught up, up yet. So you know, if, if they take the, the fat trim, the outside fat, and incorporate that into a product, that's actually, um, and it, the ground beef will be um, uh, more enriched with oleic acid. That's pretty cool. So are there specific subprimals that have more oleic uh, acid in them just naturally? Yes. <laughs> Such good questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, so, uh, a few years ago, well, it was published in 2009. <laughs> Funny how time flies. It really does. <laughs> um, Stacy Turk, a master's student, uh, we had noticed that uh, when we're getting uh, fat trans to do our human studies to make the ground beef, we measure the outside fat, but then we take the flank and plate to make the ground beef and the fat acid composition wasn't the same as outside fat. We, we measure outside fat to pick, select the carcasses. Okay, at the plant, yeah, it was, okay. Uh, lower in, in oleic acid. And I huh. thought, well, that's odd. So Stacy asked, uh, she uh, was there in her master's research and said, can I take the, the next 50 carcasses that go from our Rosenthal meat science and technology uh, kill for? Mm -hmm. And so she did that and she sampled outside fat uh, from eight different sites. So the round, the loin, the chuck, the brisket, uh, the flank, the plate. And um, lo and behold, there were differences across it. And uh, what was startling, and this is good news in Texas, um, the brisket had by far the most oleic acid. And we, we <laughs> it's, uh, it's so reproducible. And, and these were cattle, we didn't know the background. They could have, I think we had some show cattle from, from Houston, we had research cattle, it, it just, so, but with those 50 carcasses, it was just really strong evidence. And, and it's again, highly reproducible. So for whatever reason, the brisket has the, uh, the most oleic acid of, of any site that, that we've sampled. That's what I was gonna ask if you know, have any, kind of inkling of why that would be. Do they add fat there first? Because I, I think of young cattle, I don't really see them having heavy brisket fat. Usually that's a sign of them being close to finish. Well, so. and that's something we would really like to answer. Um, we, we need to get funding. Well, funny, what we have to, our, my hypothesis is that the brisket fat cells develop initially as brown fat. We've done a lot. Oh, of that, that makes sense. Yeah, because yeah. you think about uh, in humans by your chest, you get a lot of brown yeah. Okay. And, and the fatty acid composition of brown fat has more oleic acid than white fat early on. Okay. So, so uh, as you accumulate fat, unless you change diet drastically, you don't turn over the fat, you add to that. So if oh. something in, in production causes you to have low oleic acid, uh, like uh, uh, backgrounding, like uh, yep. background on grass, that fat will have low oleic acid. And then when you start on corn, a, a, a grain, it'll, it has to catch up. It has to dilute the saturated fats with oleic acid. Okay. So, so um, if you start cattle really early weaning, um, the calf fed, what we call it, mm -hmm. calf fed, yearly fed, they will um, start accumulating fat and oleic acid very early, and they just keep adding to that. So maybe the brisket uh, starts with more oleic acid as brown adipose tissue, and it just adds to that as it's transition transition to a, a finishing diet. But we haven't we haven't the funds to um, but we have to kill calves early on at, at, at least um, at the very least four month intervals just to track that and and do measurements of specific gene expression that indicates differentiation of the adipocytes. <laughs> That's fascinating to me. So, that is so, cool. So I, I have to throw this out there, doctor. <laughs> this is my theory, and uh, you know, so so brisket, brisket fat. It's a it's a better fat. It has more oleic acid, which is a healthier fat. Therefore, brisket should quantify or qualify as a health food. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, okay. You reside in the state of Texas. Come, come on, no uh, whammies. I'm going to dodge that question. <laughs> but I will say, um, uh, and I don't know the regulations, but um, studies were done years ago by Dr. Joanne Lupton uh, when I was early on. She was in the nutrition uh, department at Texas A&M. And she showed that Quaker Oats um, uh, I think reduce cholesterol a little bit. It, it's the, uh, the fiber bound up uh, cholesterol in, in the GI tract. And, but Quaker Oats was able to label their uh, product. If you like, look at Quaker yes, Oats. They do. 
heart healthy or something like that? Yes, yeah. they do yeah, have that on there. Do. Well, <laughs> brisket? <I> mean, <laughs> we should, have, should but, put a heart healthy <laughs> sticker on a brisket. <laughs> <laughs> yes. uh, but that, that would be valid because we, we have studies. And again, I, I don't know regulations. I'm blissfully uh, ignorant of that. But so it, to answer your question, that could be a possibility, but someone would have to chase the, the paperwork and, and see what was involved. I, I believe I, I have you, a mission. I was gonna say, I think if you could ignite one person to do that, Brian might be that person. <laughs> Dr. Lockton, who's she's a, a great person and a, a great scientist, but these were based on a limited number of human studies. So uh, it, it's it's not like you have to get a drug approved by FDA. Yeah, go through all that requirements. Yeah, and maybe it was easier 30 years ago, um, but still, but still, yeah, it's still on their their package today. So it seems once they validate it once, it seems to be holding true throughout. So, yep. Well, you just made my day, doctor. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I'm here to please. <laughs> I do have to ask what what do you think is the most interesting thing, or to you, the most exciting thing that you've discovered within your time of research? Oh wow. Um, no, that's a pretty loaded question. <laughs> oh, because I don't know. Maybe uh, I get distracted easily because I mean I I have fun with all the things that I do. Um, I mean, I, I've I've really been invested in our human research, and I mean that's they're difficult. I mean, people do not like squeeze suits. <laughs> <laughs> Their carcasses are really hard to grade, <laughs> but uh, but, uh, but that's been exciting. Uh, okay, um, that it's not quite the thing that that I've discovered or anything, but my marbling research and my early publications and like I think my first was in 1992 with, with uh, fat from uh, Japanese cattle. That opened up so many doors to travel, um, working with um, the fatty acid composition. I was able to do a faculty development leave, like a sabbatical leave oh, in neat. Brisbane. And I packed up my wife and my, at that time, two kids. And we moved there for five months, five, five or six months. And uh, they lived in down, downtown Brisbane or next to the botanical garden. I'd oh, wow. Train. Um, because of that research. And then I started uh, doing collaborative research with folks from Kyoto University in Japan. That lasted a long time. I've, I've done a lot of research with Korea and more recently China. And I've been to, back to Australia several times. So that is that just makes my life complete. That's the most fun. And so the, the travel restrictions, the pandemic, Put a real damper on my, on my yeah. space there. Uh, I can imagine that. Was it? It's probably really neat to see too, just how they research. I mean, their protocols and everything have to be. There's similarities, of course, across the board that you can see, but there's got to be differences just within their research um, sites and their universities too. And that just had to be such a neat experience to be able to get all these different countries. Um, I, just views on things that that had to be awesome. Oh, it is, and, and so many similarities. You know, they 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 feel, they they're fully invested in corn feeding, and so Australia does does not grow corn. Uh, just it's, yeah. lim it's very limited. So you know, we we've got uh, a, t a complete advantage advantage. But China, Korea, Japan, at least for the 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 uh, last finishing period, they have a. a like a total mix ration that has a, a very much corn. Uh, uh, Japan, Korea, China, their cattle have different names, but they're all from the same genetic stock. So okay. travel across China, the, the Yanban Yellow came to Korea, the Hanu came to Japan, uh, the Wagyu mixed with their indigenous breeds and, and some other crossbreeding. But so there's some similarities, but there's some real differences. They they feed cattle for a very long time. So yeah. 
their cattle really don't show their marbling uh, capacity until they kind of pass our production in. So okay. you know, 20 months of age, that's when they really show up. So our cattle get fatter, don't to us that, that much more marbling. There's, um, do get a little fatter, but that's, that's they just keep uh, accumulating marbling. And the, the differences, uh, the cultural differences, that's what's fun. I mean, even as in Australia, but if, you know, I, I was visiting Japan, they went to Korea. Well, Koreans are just like Japanese, but they speak a different language. No, <laughs> they're really different. And, and that's what's fun to get, to learn the differences in culture, production. I mean, I'm in heaven, whatever. I, I, oh, I, like I completely agree with you. Actually, um, so it, was, it was two years ago now, coming up on two years, we had an international uh, group come in and there was actually 13 different countries that were represented there. Um, so just all these different backgrounds and not many of them, probably only five or six actually spoke English, but we had two different translators to help. And at one point, so we had a dry aged rib that we let hang in our cooler for close to uh, 400 days. It was just a fun side experiment. Yes. Whoa. We, did, we did not really care about yields at that time. Yes. But on the 365th day, its birthday is when we had all these different countries in there. And so I told them the day before, I'm like, okay, when you guys get here, we're going to sing happy birthday, this rib. And it was, it was neat because, so first I sang it in English and then we had some uh, Latin Americans in there. So Spanish, like they jumped in right away and sang. And then it was just a little bit of a silent pause. And then the Japanese went, well, can we sing too? So then they went and sang, and then every single country, I mean, we had uh, South Korea, cool. just everywhere, just started singing. The, it was one of the neatest experiences because you all come together knowing beef and loving beef, mm -hmm. but you bring your culture with you. And so you get to grow and learn from them at the same time. So I completely agree with you. It's just, it's such a great thing to gather around and, and talk about. And then you're, you're able to share your experiences too, and everyone can grow together. So completely agree. I was uh, invited allowed to co-chair a session at a, a, a meeting in Kagoshima, Japan. And the, the topic was um, production of beef around the world or something like that. I, I wrote a little review paper uh, summarizing it. But that was a real eye opener. You know, I don't only dealt with countries that were uh, producing high quality beef. But in oh, Malaysia yeah. or Thailand, or I mean, they're feeding whatever's left over. Uh, wow, they would yeah. never feed corn to cattle because um, for one thing, they, if, they grow, if they can grow grains, of course it's for human consumption. So yeah. anything left over, they, or, or, or any waste food products, they'll feed the cattle. And the breed types, oh, that won't marble. Well, they don't care. They're just <laughs> trying to get high quality protein. Eating yes. quality is not the primary issue for them. So yes. that was, um, but again, as you said, getting get together with so many different cultures and, and that was a real eye opener. You know, I take cater to the rich, yes. um, but you know, it, it's, that's a small proportion of, of the world. Oh yeah, the whole beef production. You're totally yeah. right on that. It's awesome. So, but the good news is everybody's trying to in, increase beef consumption. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that speaks well for maybe some uh, export of beef for the U S so. Yeah, that is very true. <laughs> Amen. Well, I'm doing my part to help drive demand. So okay. <laughs> <laughs> my consumption alone. So, well, I'm, I eat everything, anything that doesn't start chewing on me first. <laughs> <laughs> It's fair game. <laughs> Standing. Diana, anything else you want to touch on? No, I just want to thank you. This has been awesome. I love, you know, at the beginning of this, I was even nervous. I mean, you're such an expert in your field, just being able to, to communicate, but you, you make things very simple to understand. And um, yeah, it, just fascinating. You can see your excitement in your research just simply by talking to you, which is, I love to see that. It's so much fun. Well, some of the excitement comes from you know, leaving rat research to animal production research. 
it's a whole different group of people. They're fun. Yeah. They have an <laughs> end goal. You know, when I was a, a grad student, I, what are you working on? Well, I, I isolate rat liver cells. And, <laughs> and, and now I say, what are you working on? I, and, you know, the, the elevator talk, well, I want to increase the amount of marbling and the health of the fat in the marbling. And they go, oh, you do grass feeding. <laughs> 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 oh, let's ride the elevator a few more times let's talk yeah, <laughs> yeah. That's a, only three stories but you know but <laughs> I, I take the stairs it's, it's yeah. a, <laughs> that question that question can't come up in texas can it <laughs> uh, oh you know college station is uh, I'm a mixed group of people. I mean, when I first got to Texas, it was mostly Texans and a few Californians. And, you know, um, but boy, we have a, such a mix here now. So lots of different opinions. here. I, I never, you know, I teach um, uh, this semester a, a lipids class and uh, graduate lipids and lipid metabolism. And um, these are people from the nutrition department, from health and kinesiology, from, from animal science, poultry science. But some of these people don't eat meat at all. Oh, wow. I don't, I haven't had a vegan yet, but lots of vegetarians are, uh, you know, some shade of that. So I, I, um, I intentionally don't pr uh, promote the consumption of beef because um, people have different uh, attitudes, opinions, philosophies. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I'm, that's, that's good. You yeah. Know. It's your choice. That's right. it's your More choice. for the rest of us. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, and I'll tell you, this is just where my brain lives. When I think of College Station, Texas, I don't think about college football, which I know is what a lot of Northerners. Think. I think about our buddy Justin Manning over at CNJ Barbecue and, uh, you know, <laughs> delightful brisket he's cooking up every day. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I have my favorite brisket place. And, you know, I, I take my visitors. Well, I'm a cheap date. <laughs> um. I, I, I take them there because it, well, it is cheap and there's, there's of course beef and there's, there's chicken, but, but it's Texas. So if, if you're going to experience, you got to have it. Yeah. Why go to an olive garden? Oh, you got to cut that one out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not a olive garden connoisseur. <laughs> endless breadsticks though is, you know, you know. Uh -oh. Credit where it's okay. due. And a salad is to die for. <laughs> <laughs> it is not Texas. <laughs> uh, on, on that note, uh, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Steve Smith, uh, Regents Professor of Meat Science at Texas A&M University, Gigum down in College Station, for, for joining us here on the Meat Speak podcast. And the man who has personally given me enough fodder to 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 really run with the notion that brisket is the new kale so <laughs> sir th thank you for joining us uh on the meat speak podcast if this is your first time tuning in know that you can catch us across all of your major podcasting platforms apple google play spotify or simply by visiting certifiedingasbeef.com slash podcast so uh dr steve smith meat scientist diana clark guys thank you so much for taking time this is fascinating i am starving Ha, 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 ha.